Okay, so I've just started the recording now. Um, I would like to welcome everybody to our third coronavirus swing catalyst <laughs> webinar. <laughs> um, these, are, these have been good. The past couple of weeks, it gives us a chance to uh, you know, get our minds off everything that's going on in the world right now and to talk about some things that we're all passionate about, things that uh, you know, we would all be doing every day if it weren't for this thing. So um, I think this is fun to, uh, to get people's minds off things and talk about stuff that we all you know, would be talking about anyways if there wasn't uh, everything else going on in the world. So this is super fun. So today we have uh, three co-hosts, um, three people I've worked with quite a bit on Swing Catalyst. Um, and I'm going to give you guys a chance to just introduce yourselves and talk to everyone, tell people a bit about yourselves and what you do. Uh, and we'll start with Ben Shear. Um, ben is the one who kind of developed the concepts that we're going to be, or not kind of did develop the concepts that we're going to be talking about today. And it's a really useful way to use um, ground reaction force technology, the swing catalyst technology to really understand the human being that's standing in front of you so that you can help uh, every single player. So Ben, if you can just introduce yourself a little bit to everyone. Well, thanks, Scott, and uh, thanks everybody for joining. I hope everyone out there is safe and healthy uh, during this crazy time. But yeah, I've been working uh, as a performance coach in the golf world since 1991. Started with my first tour player in 1998, 1999, somewhere around there. So I've been doing this a long time. Uh, I would say that I'm traditionally an early adapter to technology no. and, and love using technology to help uh, my players and our clients at our gym every day uh, maximize their potential. And, and, you know, being involved with technology for a long time, you know, we get all this great information, but I think sometimes we just blindly follow it. And, you know, I, I kind of asked myself one day when I was just standing on a driving range at a tour event, watching Jason Day on one end of an, uh, the range and Phil Mickelson on the other end, watching them both just absolutely crush balls and said, man, these guys are just doing it differently. Even though there's certain things we think are the same and we know are the same, there's also certainly differences in it. And, and how do we start figuring out what the difference was? And that's how I started kind of digging around with swing catalysts, trying to understand you know, why can they both hit it so far using such different strategies? And, you know, that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. Perfect. That's great. And so to me, what I've always talked about science-wise, looking at the golf swing is we need to do something called cluster analysis. If everybody doesn't do the same thing, we got to put little boxes around people and say, because of X, Y, and Z, this person needs to do these things. And because of A, B, and C, this person needs to do these things. And, and this is something that I think... Um, uh, I, I mean, Mike Adams was one of the first ones who really talked or showed me that there were systems to try to put people in little boxes. And I think we've all kind of studied under him and, and learned and kind of adapted and created a whole bunch of stuff that uh, um, that can be really helpful in helping every single golfer. And this is going to be something we're talking about today. Hey, you can call this a sub box. Sub box. Perfect. A, bo a box within your style. You know, your style. Another delineation, however you want to think about it. Perfect. I like that a lot. Awesome. All right, um, and so Kevin Sprecher is joining us as well. So we, we have Ben who's developed this test and then Kevin and Sprecher and Debbie Doniger are two top 100 teachers who have worked a lot with Ben on using this technique or this testing strategy to help their players. And so um, I'll let Kevin introduce himself first and talk a little bit about uh, what he does. Thanks, Scott. Uh, hi to everybody else. Um, thanks for all the viewers out there. So I've been in golf uh, longer than I can, you know, started actually working for Jim McLean back in 1992. Uh, and we used to, we did a lot of research back then with Jim and, and we didn't have the technology that we have now. So we were, we kind of stumbled upon some things. We, we watched a lot of videos and then you know, we got a lot of people better and some people got worse because we taught them wrong. And as technology advanced, you know, being, being with Jim for all those years, he was always at the forefront of technology, which for me is a, is a hobby. Um, as as everyone knows, I'm a, I'm a tech kind of guy too, just like Ben. I'm, I'm always trying to get what's out there first and see how it works. And um, so I worked for Jim for 25 years. And then now I've been at the Sleepy Hollow Country Club up in New York for the last 18 years as director of instruction. I've uh, been with Swing Cat for three years. Uh, and it's really kind of opened my eyes to, you know, how, how the body, you know, or how the ground and how, how the feet affect the rest of the swing. Um, I'm often asked if I were starting up a new teaching center, what, what technology would I always start with? And, and actually swing cats, the first thing, or some kind of ground, ground reaction force system, um, way over a, a launch monitor, because I can see, you know, I can't see what the, what the feet are doing on the ground. 
in video or anything, but I can kind of, you know, I can figure out with, with the ball and the other stuff. So, so this, you know, the technology has been an eye opener for me. Uh, and then learning Ben's system, you know, the resistors and stuff. I always knew people, you know, some people needed different types of swings, but I didn't have any information behind it or, or stuff. So Ben opened my eyes up to a lot of different tests that I can do for my players. And it's really helped me, uh, help me work with my players. Awesome. Thank you, man. And I think that's something that, um, you know, it's really interesting. I, I imagine if when you first started working with a launch monitor a long time ago, there were shots where you maybe couldn't have predicted it quite as well. Um, but once you get working with the technology long enough, I think you start seeing what you see with your eye and trying to correlate it to what the, the technology tells you. Because, um, I mean, I, I still think there are times when I look at something and I'm like, oh, I think that person has to have, you know, a ton of pressure in their right foot or, you know, a ton of horizontal force or whatever it is. And, and sometimes you get it wrong. Sometimes you look at the, at the data afterwards and you're like, ooh, I would have gone way the wrong way if I didn't have access to, to the technology. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that, and and been studying on the swing cat for three years now. I, you know, even without using it, I'm I'm definitely more sensitive to, to you know the, the foot and how things are changing, and and you know it's kind of a game for me now. You know, am I correct? And then I like to to measure it with the swing cat to see if I'm actually incorrect. Right, and I think it then helps get a lot of buy-in from your players, so that when they can show them on the screen, hey, this is what you're actually doing. It's not just my opinion that you're too much in your right side or whatever. Um, because a lot of times, like you say, feels can be a lot different than reels, right? So the, what the player is feeling in their head a lot of time is is way different from what's happening in real life. Absolutely. And that's at all levels of players, too. You know, just because they're a tour player doesn't mean, you know, it's not the same. They may be in a little bit more in tune to it, but, but you know, it's very different for everybody. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Thank you, Kevin. And then uh, I believe upstairs is Debbie Doniger. <laughs> uh, and so uh, if Debbie could introduce herself a little bit as well and, and you're going to be talking about some of the players you work with and how you've used this information as well yeah hi I'm Debbie I hope everybody's okay um, first and foremost obviously I don't really do many of these so thank you Scott for including me um, I would say my background is I played for a living um, played as a kid since I'm seven and seriously, since I'm 12, Jim McLean was my teacher my whole life growing up and through college and through the, the European tour was the main tour that I played. And I've been teaching for 25 plus years now and worked for him for over 20. I would say that, you know, since a lot of people don't know my background, within the last five or six years, I've uh, reinvigorated i guess my relationship with mike adams whom i've known since i'm 17 he's been huge for me um and then my relationship with the fourth third box over there ben Shear. um he and i have spent a ton of time together and then um i've also branched out and watched and learned from a whole host of other teachers so for example Chuck Cook and Randy Smith, and I even went out and saw Mike Malaska and Butch Harmon. So I have a very well-rounded uh, base, I think. But the key thing with these, you know, with all you guys in this box and for everybody watching and listening is within my um, experience and my education and um, all of those cool things, there have been holes or puzzle pieces missing and uh my a lot of my work with ben and mike um have really put it all together one i guess the swing cat i don't have it so any really top player that i have where number one i don't want to injure the player number two that player needs to get better i need to make sure that i take as much guesswork out of the equation as possible and it's like those little tiny nuances um, where can put that player over the edge. I like to create teams of really top, top people and um, work as a team to make sure that that player gets better. And that's exactly what you're going to see in my example. So thanks to everybody in my world. It's a small world, but they all help me get better. And, and this piece of technology has really helped. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I think this is something that, you know, like you say, um, it is, you know, a pretty expensive piece of technology, the ground reaction force plates, so the force plates and the pressure plates. And, but I think I have talked to a lot of instructors around the world who, who have made connections with people in their area. And so, you know, if, if one person in your area has it and you can bring your good players in and, 
and do the testing and get get familiar with what's going on between their feet and the ground. So again, like you're not guessing. Um, so making friends with people around you and and you know having having teams of people working together, I think, is super important. All right, so let's get into the nitty gritty of this thing. So um, this is something that Ben, I believe, you first presented this around 2016, 17 ish. I think 16. The first the first version of it, I think was 2016. Perfect. So um, this is something that he's been thinking about in terms of, like I said, doing a, a form of cluster analysis. So putting golfers into little groups so you can understand um, why a golfer would need to do something different than another golfer. And, you know, a lot of tests that Mike Adams uses looks at anthropometric differences. So how you're built different from somebody else. Um, a lot of tests that Mike Adams looks at looks at uh, movement pattern differences. So how you choose to move your body is something that you could put people in little groups about. But um, I don't think anyone was really testing uh, or I didn't know too many people who were testing people's physiology. So looking at the makeup of their nervous systems and how that was um, affecting how they were producing movement. And I think this is one of the tests that that does that. And I think what I really like about this test is that it's a test of a human being, of an athlete, really, rather than a golfer. Um, and I think that's something we've talked about. We're not testing them in golf posture with a golf club in their hand. So they're not thinking golf swing. They're just thinking, I need to be a human and do an athletic move. Um, and that helps give us a lot of information about uh, about what they're doing. So let's start your presentation here, Ben. I will share my screen and go to your, your PowerPoint. Whoops, let me get back out of here first. That's if I converted it properly. Yeah, no, you're good. Oh. It was worth it. <laughs> you're, you're a Mac guy, so we had to do a little fancy footwork to get it to be what we wanted it to be. All right, so are you guys now seeing my screen? Yes. Okay, yeah. perfect. It hasn't shown up on Facebook yet, but there's a tiny little delay, but that's fine. Okay, so that's the little title slide I started with. This is Ben's fancy presentation. Whoops. There we go. This is pretty neat, Ben. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> and I have your contact information there. Perfect. So if you guys want to take note of that, if you have any questions about anything, please get in contact with Ben, but I'll let Ben uh, take over from here and um, 2016 copyright. Uh, so I'll just let me know when you want me to change the slides, Ben, but I'll let you take over and, and start to introduce this concept. Yeah, so like I said, I mean, the, the idea really came to me standing on a driver's ra driving range and I was like, you know, why, you know, why are these guys both so successful with such different strategies? Why do I often hear, you know, clients who come to my gym, forget about who are tour players, we're like, I used to be a this handicap and, or I've lost 30 yards in the last two years and all of this stuff. And it was like, okay, you know, it's easy to say it's a physiology answer, but like, what about their physiology makes one person better than the other? And being a trainer by trade, that's my job. I'm a performance coach, strength and conditioning guy, whatever you want to call it. Um, I, I'm always trying to understand how the muscular system, the neuromuscular system, all of those things play a role. And we always hear about, you know, things in golf, like X factor stretch and all this stuff. So you know, I, I always started, Scott, you can kind of go to the next slide. And I, and I asked the question simply, what do these guys all have in common? Right. And so we have uh, Bubba Watson, Jason Day, Rory McIlroy, Gary Woodland, uh, John Daly, and Phil Mickelson. And, you know, the, the answer that I have is these guys all hit it really, really far. You know, these are some of the biggest hitters on the world. Uh, who can actually find the ball. I'm not talking about long drive guys. Um, I think at the end, I would say that long drive guys use a combination of these two styles, uh, but guys who can actually find the ball and play on a competitive level. Uh, there's two different types of strategies here. So if we go to the next group, it's okay, how do we start subcategorizing these guys who kind of have different philosophies or strategies, so we'd say, and, and what is the difference amongst them? So when I say, what do these guys have in common? So this is now Jason Day. Uh, Gary Woodland and Rory and if, and if you take a good look at all of those three guys they really have a pretty restricted lower body turn in their backswing and none of them are beyond parallel with their club at the top right so these are the guys you know you traditionally think of as quote unquote the modern golf swing uh, x-factor stretch Jim McLean kind of ter term and Phil Cheatham uh, you know, that they're kind of getting that big coil through their muscular system. They're getting that angular loading of the trunk from the lead hip to the opposite side shoulder, that diagonal sling. Then they fire that lower body first. They get that big stretch. They're using that stretch shorten and that recoiling, which boom, then allows them to create this whipping action uh, 
that creates a lot of speed. You know, people talk about towel snaps and cracking the whip and all, all of those analogies that people like to use. I think these guys are great examples of people who do that really, really well. I mean, if you look at Woodland, I mean, he's so short, it's crazy, right? But we know he's an explosive guy. The guy was playing college basketball. He's an explosive athlete by nature. Forget about golf. You know, he, we know he's that type of guy. I mean, guys like Tony Finau would fall in that bucket. I mean, obviously other players, I'm just giving uh, a few examples of guys who I think that most of us know and can understand and visualize their swings and what they do. So that's one way. These guys hit it really far, and they're using that strategy. And then if I click over to the next slide, you got John Daly, you got Phil Mickelson, and you got Bubba Watson, right? And if we look at these guys, wow, they have their knees moving in. They have – some of them have their heel off the ground. They got big hip turn, club long, way beyond parallel. They got a totally different – there's nothing restricted about what they're doing at all. So the first guys, I call those guys resistors, the J-Day type of the world. And these guys here, I call releasers. They are releasing everything on the front side to get a bigger, deeper turn and give themselves distance and time, right? So the guys with the resisted swings have a shorter, more compact swing, less time and distance, where these players have a release swing, which gives them more distance or opportunity to create speed. So, right, they're both using totally different strategies, but coming up with somewhat of a similar uh, yardage result, uh, I would say. Yeah, so let's just move on here, right? So, right, so like I said, there's similar distance results, two different ways of getting there. The, mus the muscle recruitment and speed generations differ in resistors and releasers, right? So these re the resistors, they're using that stretch shorten. They're using that X-factor stretch. Uh, they're using all of that, you know, recoiling of the muscular system. The releasers are not. They're actually giving themselves enough time to actually go get it. They're actually consciously creating their speed a little bit more uh, without the stretch reflex, and they're doing it because they have enough time to get there, right? Like if you think about, you know, race cars having different distances to start, right? You know, some, we can all end up with the same top speed, but some people need to, <laughs> some people can get there much quicker and other people need a little bit of an extra time to get up to speed, right? So the releasers are give, giving themselves a little bit more distance to get up to speed where the resistors have less distance, but somehow are still able to get there as well, right? So I would traditionally say that our resistors are your more athletic, dynamic athletes. Uh, and our releasers are less dynamic. Not that they're not dynamic. Many of those guys are great athletes in their own right. So I don't want to say that they're not, but they're using a strategy that, how should I say, relies on that less. Um, I, I think one of the things, you know, before I get too deep into this, is understand is that people will also change over time. You could be a resistor as a young athletic kid you know, whatever, as you grow up and maybe through your 20s, then all of a sudden you get a job and you're sitting at your desk and all of a sudden you look up and you're 40 years old and you've been sitting behind a desk for 50 hours a week and all of a sudden, you know, you learn the modern golf swing with X-Factor stretch and all that stuff and all of a sudden you can't hit it anywhere. And you're like, well, what happened, right? So the reality is most research we do in golf is done on young athletic population or world-class population, right? So we test tour players, traditionally, and we test at universities, big time D1 schools that have college golf teams, right? So the population by nature is already kind of has a confirmation bias built into the outcome due to the population, right? So if you're already playing at college, odds are you're a pretty athletic guy if you have that type of talent and you're in an age group where you haven't lost the elasticity and the ability to use stretch shorten. That same person at 50 years old and sitting behind the desk for 25 years, all of a sudden is not so stretchy. They are not so whippy. And they haven't lost their talent, but their system and the ability to use that stretch short in the, the muscles has gone away. It's why, you know, use, I'm a Yankee fan, so I always use Derek Jeter as an example. Like, why at some point in his career did he have to retire? Did he become less talented? No. His neuromuscular system slowed down just a beat. Why do old people on the extreme end, why can they fall just stepping off of a curve, right? They fall because their neuromuscular system, the timing of it is slowing down. Their brain can't send the message to the muscle when their foot hits the ground, stepping off the curb, fire now, stabilize now, do whatever it needs to do in that moment, right? That's an extreme example, right? And it's a slow degradation over time. But this is happening to all of us every single day. And it's happening to your students every single 
day. So, you know, there's a point in time where we kind of are young and we're getting better, 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 better. And then it's kind of, you get a level off and then you eventually, the seesaw tips the other way and you start going down. So understand that just because somebody was successful one way when they were young, doesn't inherently mean they're going to be successful in another way when they get older. So let's, let's kind of go through and understand a little bit better. Okay, so our resistors, they're the athletic people and they make up the minority of hitters. You hear that? The minority. Most people are not gonna be good resistors. Making your stu most of your students resist their hips is not a great idea, right? So the majority of people, Scott, going back and forth, giving me. It's switching on its own here. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, don't worry. So okay. move through it. So okay. those are your super, these are your super athletic population. They're super, they're using that stretch short and really effectively. But understand, if we think of the, the injuries of golfers, the guys who have really resisted swings tend to be the guys who are also the most injured. Jason Day, Tiger Woods, go down the list of the guys who really have big resisted swings because it puts a lot more force into your system. It is a lot more kind of dangerous swing than a release swing. You know, we don't see the kind of release guys, the Phil Mickelsons, the Bubba's, those kind of guys ever suffering back pain, those type of things. So the releasers, I'm going to say they are the majority. It takes less pure physical ability and athleticism to get the body into a good position to transition. Most people, if you just say, hey, okay, you can let it go can kind of get into a reasonably good position. As soon as you tell them, don't move your lower body, coil, turn, get, your, get a bigger shoulder turn, get your arms here, do all that stuff where things tend to kind of often break down. So it's also great for longevity. Uh, this is a much lower stress golf swing for your body. So, you know, I don't want to overstate this, but I would say if you're teaching people over 50 years old, yes, you can do the testing we're going to show you today. Uh, but if I, I'm not a golf teacher, but if I were teaching people over the age of 50 or maybe even over 40 something who sit a lot, I would make everybody a releaser. I would get rid of resisting lower body, to be honest. I think they will all hit it further. Their bodies will feel better. The aches and pains will go down. You name it. I think it's a net positive for most people over, uh, you know, probably 40 years old. Uh, I have tested some 40 year olds who do test out to be a resistor. But those people who are the people who go to the gym all the time, they're super fit, they eat healthy, like they're the athletic population. They are not the general population. So I don't want to say uh, that we don't have anybody. I think you tested Cameron McCormick, right, Scott? And he tested as a resistor. Yeah, yeah. I think you remember saying like, it'd be rare to see somebody above 40 who was a resistor. Um, and then I remember I was at his place and we were running these tests and yeah, he tested out to be a resistor. And, and I asked him, like, what kind of workouts do you do? And he's in the gym religiously every morning, and they're doing plyometrics, and he's done. And so yeah, it is possible to take to take an older body and turn them into a or keep them as because I'm, I'm guessing that's something you're kind of inherently born with and then lose probably. Uh, and some people maybe aren't even born with it. So um, yeah. and we don't really know the answer to that question. But uh, yeah, Co Chris Como also tested out as a resistor, but also a guy who, you know, sits and drinks bone broth all day and is in the <laughs> doing the whole thing, right? So, I mean, so when I did it with Chris, uh, you know, he was a resistor also, but those are guys, like you said, these are guys who probably were pretty ballistic as a youngster yeah. and who have basically never gone away from it. They haven't ever spent 50 hours a week sitting behind a desk or doing any of those things. They live an active lifestyle. They're standing, they're out on the golf course, they're walking, they're in the gym, they're eating healthy, they're doing all those things. So I don't want to say that nobody can be a resistor because that would not be true, right. um, but that the percentage is very low. Is right, low. And, and I think uh, it, it's kind of a continuum more than boxes, I would say. You're kind of, I would say you can put somebody kind of halfway, and so I think that's what you're trying to test out, right, is the, the biggest, and I think your test can really give you an idea. Um, well, and I think it even shows you kind of how much one or the other you can be. Because sure. like we'll see with Debbie's example, we had a girl who was pretty similar as in leg dominance or whatever. Hey, like, not, don't give it not away. Not everybody, <laughs> not everybody is going to have a massive variance. Right. Some people are going to have massive variances, right? So there, like you said, there is a continuum of this and how much you let them release or resist can be, you know, determined by the testing that we do. Good, I like that. Um, so there's a question that came in from our, our ambassador Leon um, in Germany slash Luxembourg. He said, the expectation is that releasers are less prone to injury and consistency. I don't know if that'd be the case, but um, I'll let you respond Meaning to that. Less prone to consistency, what does that mean? That I guess they'd be, be less consistent. Yeah. I mean, they're definitely less prone to injury. You would agree with that? 100%. 
Okay. And I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, um, I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't say that, you know, you look at Tiger, he's not a great accurate driver of the ball. Jay Day is not an accurate driver of the ball. I mean, I, again, I mean, we'd, I guess we'd have to do some statistical analysis to kind of tease right. that out. It might be interesting to do. I think it's a cool question. Right. Um, but I would say that most people that I've, who, I think it's more about doing what your body is designed to do. I think if you're doing what your body is designed to do, you should get more distance and more accuracy. The right. more you're fighting your body, I think the bigger issues you have, right? And, and we'll, you'll, we'll show an example of a guy that we took who was a good player, who was a resisting. We turned him into a releaser, and his face-to-path relationship got dramatically better. And we'll show that here now. And his speed I, I, got I would better, say yeah. that it's more about doing what your, what your physiology says you should do, more so than one style inherently being better or worse. Okay. Good. Um, I think I'll leave. I got a couple more questions here, but I think I'll let you keep going here and we'll, we'll get to those in a second. All right. Um, now I think we're, your thing was going forward on its own and now it's stuck. Okay, here we go. Okay. Now we're going to talk about a little uh, kinematic sequence differences. Yeah. So for those people who don't know what this is, these are kinematic sequence graphs. I'm not going to say who they are, but they are two of the players that we did show so far today. Um, if you look at the, the left part of your screen, let's just focus on that one first, just so people understand what a kinematic sequence graph is. I'm going to put my glasses on here so I can even see. Right? <laughs> so the, re the red line that you're looking at is the person's pelvis. We're looking at rotational velocities of their pelvis, their thorax, their arms, and the club. Everything below the zero line is backswing. Everything above the zero line is downswing. So if we, look, if we look at this first one here on the left, right, you can see as this person transitions from backswing to downswing, how all those lines literally are laying right on top of each other. Uh, Phil Cheatham has termed this, uh, he calls them riders. He has what he calls stretchers, fanners, and riders. Uh, in the 3D world, we call those riders, meaning that kind of everything is turning at the same velocity. It doesn't mean that they're lined up, that your shoulder is lined up with your hips. It means the the rotation is happening at the same velocity. Everything is kind of turning together, right? At, at least initially there as they go into transition, right? If we look at the other one on our right, what you see when they go from transition to the zero above the, from the backswing to the downswing is you see that red line comes out of the gate and crosses the zero line much sooner. Bring your, yeah, cursor down there, yeah, there. right? So that's that pelvis starting sooner. That's X-factor stretch there. Right, so those Jim McLean would talk about that's creating getting that lower body firing first, the upper body staying back. Right, that's the pelvis getting out of the gate early, and the area and the space between it is the actual amount of stretch that they are creating. So, not sure how comfortable everybody is with 3D biomechanics, but this validated when I went in and started looking at some of the 3D data I had of my tour players. When I came up with my idea, I said, Let me pull up some 3D data on these guys and I happen to have a lot of tour data, this validated that I knew what I was saying was right. Because if I look on the left, that is a person, that is a releaser. That person is getting everything turning together. They're not using a big X factor stretch. There's a little tiny, tiny baby one there. None of this is absolutes. There's definitely like a continuum of it, but pretty much they're turning everything together. And the one on the right, you see the person is a resistor and they have a very big X factor stretch. And this person on the right has suffered injury issues uh, as well. So I felt like, wow, you know, we're using ground reaction forces to do our testing, but at the same time, we're validating it through kinematic sequence stuff that we had collected previous to that. So when those two started lining up, I felt, wow, that's pretty interesting to see. I feel pretty good about what I'm saying. Right. And I think to, really interesting is the rate of change in velocity, which would be your acceleration. So you see how kind of a, a slow ramp that one is. So it's getting up to speed, but it's taking its time getting there. Whereas this one has a much steeper ramp there. So that's, that's a, a, a lot. It's moving much quicker. It's, it's accelerating much faster. Um, and so this would be the more ballistic um, and, and because they, Yeah. And because their club isn't as far back, they need it to happen quicker. And right. this guy's got that long across the line beyond parallel swing. They have more time. Right. So they don't need as sharp of a slope. Perfect. I like it. Okay. So 
Again, the releaser on the left, more of a rider, if you understand kinematic sequence type terms like uh, Phil Cheatham has developed, and a more of a stretcher um, for the releaser on the on the right hand side. We wouldn't see too many fanners on the PGA Tour, would we? We, I don't think you're on the PGA. Yeah. Tour. <laughs> All right, like, that might be many of your students that are out. <laughs> a fan right. would be a person who you actually see the upper body out in front of the lower body. Where they right. Are so if you saw the pelvis underneath the the other lines there, yeah, that would be somebody who's yeah, fanning. Fanning. Perfect. Okay, let's move on here. So, so this little graph here, again, is not meant, it's not specific to this, but it's basically from Essentials of Strength and Conditioning book in, in our world. And it's just showing how different types of training or different types of athletes, how force is created relative to time, right? So if I look at this uh, little key here, the solid line are untrained people. The dotted red-ish line is heavy, people who do heavy weight lifting. And the explosive ballistic guys are this other black dotted line. Right, so if we look across the forces on the left side of the axis and time along the bottom. So we look, the ballistic guy, he comes right out of the gate really quick. And like Scott mentioned earlier, by looking in that 3D graph, you can see they have a much steeper slope. They, cre they create that force much quicker. But then you see them start to level off sooner. If we look at the person who did the heavy resistance stuff, right, their slope is much slower but they do intersect. And at some point, that person may pass them. But we do need to understand that there's so both strategies potentially can work, but I'm gonna need more, if I have a slower slope, I need more time to create that speed. And obviously golf, time is of the limit, right? Because you can only get that club back so far, you can only release so much, you can only have so much time before you actually have to hit the ball, right? So this is just showing you from a physiology perspective that the ballistic people can get there quicker in less time and that the other type of people need more time to get there. Perfect. All right. And so there we're showing the actual graph. So this is the resistor who looks with that very steep slope and he would be correlated to the black line here. Yep. And then the releaser with a very a, a less steep slope in their kinematic sequence graph, which would again be correlated to the to the right. red line. Perfect. Right. What happens after a few uh, liquid courages to JD swing here? <laughs> it gets a little longer and <laughs> longer and looser. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, maybe this is a good time. I got a couple little questions here. So um, we got another European, uh, Charlie here asks us, um, can you help a 40 plus year old golfer increase club head speed with training? So not by lengthening their swing by simply doing physical training. And I think like you said, with uh, Chris Como and uh, Cameron McCormack, they're both, I don't know, is Como more than 40? He's got to be close. Yeah, he's um, <laughs> All right. Uh, both those guys have, have literally kept their ability to do the resistance type this, swing this is by what training I would, probably. Yeah, I would say it depends on a how ballistic you were in the first place mm -hmm. b how long you've been not training sitting behind a desk blah 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 yeah what past injuries you may or may not have had and then how much time and intensity do you have available to make that change right so i would say the answer is yes but i would say it's a lot harder than you think and you better be really committed and have been pretty ballistic to start in the first place. Right, good. Okay, and then his follow-up. All right, go ahead, Kev. I can actually interject on that because I am over 40. And I, <laughs> and I actually did a test on that. Uh, when I was 47, I wanted to see how fast I could swing. Uh, my average speed was about 110 with a driver. So I hooked up with a trainer, worked out a you know, specific thing, didn't do anything to my golf swing, and uh, I maxed out at 118. It took about four months. Of, of solid training, but, you know, but I was able to do it. Hmm. So, so the answer is definitely yes. And, and I agree with Ben. I mean, I was, I was never a slow swinger, uh, but, but 118 was awfully fast for me at age 47. Right. That is fast. That's yeah. fast at any age. 
And look, I mean, obviously, you really, if you're going to do it as science, you'd have to like have 3D kinematics and ground force data and see, has your, did your actual swing change also? I mean, it, it's a very complex thing. And again, I'm not discouraging people from doing it. Look, I think you can get better. I mean, look, that's my business, right? I mean, that's how I get paid, to help people do those things. So I, I'm not discouraging people. Uh, what I'm saying is if you think you're going to sit behind a desk for 60 hours a week and go to the gym two hours a week and think that you're going to make big club head speed changes, especially if you weren't a pretty fast swinger in the first place, I'm going to say that's going to be pretty tough. Good. Perfect. I like it. And, then, and another just as a caveat, I don't like people doing a lot of speed training until their body's actually prepared to do speed training. Because, you know, just taking a guy who's immobile, unstable, all of that stuff, and just doing a lot of super explosive stuff is a recipe for injury. Right. And then you got to have some baseline uh, physical skills before you're going to go down that path. Yeah, I think definitely that, you know, the training, you know, because I was doing speed training at the same time that the, the, the working out definitely allowed me to work on speed training more, more efficiently. Uh, I was very careful not to do speed training at the beginning because my body wasn't ready for it. But when I, I slowly worked up to it uh, and that, you know, you know, so I definitely agree with that statement from Ben. Yeah, I think right. that's exactly. He did. So, you know, look, Kev did it the right way. Um, you know, he's a big, tall guy with long levers, you know, so he, you know, he's got ability to create some good speed and I'm sure was a pretty ballistic guy as when he was younger. So, you know, I, I think you got to kind of, it's all relative to where you started from as a kid, I guess. Right. And, and how much time you have to work towards it going forward. Perfect. Okay. So I think we should get into the example now, right? Of, of the guy that yep. we, uh, okay, yep. perfect. Let's do that. So let me go to my swing cat software here. Um, and so this was a player who came by our booth at the PGA show, just came by talking about, uh, I think he is now teaching, um, the game and he told us that he played some on the Canadian tour, um, or whatever it's called now. Um, but he played on the Canadian tour as a younger person and he said that he used to hit it really far and now he's lost a ton of speed and he, he's, he doesn't hit it anywhere anymore. And I believe this guy would be, you know, maybe mid forties ish now. Um, and so you see, here's his initial swing. Uh, we have the three ground reaction forces here. You can see his vertical is extremely small. Um, there's not much vertical force happening there because there's the tour average up there. Um, and the horizontal is his kind of dominant power source to start with. He's swinging, I believe this was like a seven iron ish at 83.8 miles per hour. And there's a huge face to path differential there, Ben. So it's negative 6.9 means that thing's going to curve quite a bit um, to the left. And so if you, uh, if you watch that golf swing there, I mean, looks good. Um, you know, if you're just looking at it uh, aesthetically, I'll play it one more time here from the front view so you guys, you guys can have a look. But the second when you hear somebody say something like he told us where he used to hit it really far and he's lost a ton of speed, I think this would be when this testing would be good to see or to prove to him that he, he's a different animal than he was when he was 20. Or anybody trying to increase distance, I think just sure. that is super valuable. Right. Okay. So the test involves, um, as I said, I, I really like this testing protocol because it tests, um, it tests the human being being an athlete, not trying to be a golfer. Because a lot of times, I think we've talked about this quite a bit. If you put them in a position and try to um, assess them with a golf club in their hand and golf posture, then they do what maybe they think they should do as a golfer instead of what they would normally do as a human being. Um, and so this one, they're not trying to be a golfer at all. You're, the test, the first test is a counter movement jump where you say, stand with your hand on your hips, bend down and jump as high as you possibly can. And this is what he did here. I wanna, I was looking at something here, Ben, which I thought was really interesting. I'll, I'll show it to you in a sec here. So he bends down and he jumps up. Um, and the first thing we wanna look at is how much vertical force he can create when doing that. Um, and so if you look right here, the peak of his vertical force right when he's about to take off for his jump is about 230% verticals. So that's the amount of vertical force he's putting into the ground. What I wanted to show you, Ben, what I thought was really interesting is he's creating a ton of medial lateral force. Yeah. And this, this, this is force pushing off of his right leg um, and producing a ground reaction force that's shoving him towards the screen he's, here. He's 58% on his pressure in his left yeah. side. On his left side. And then as soon as he gets to the peak of that, you'll notice it shoots over to his other foot. So he's producing that shear force that shoots him there now. Because when he's taking off, he's almost 100% on his left foot. Or that's he is 100% a separate conversation you and I have been having about the other testing. 
Right. So that's, that's a very interesting thing yeah. about this guy's physiology, which his body decides when it's time to, to go, I want to shoot that pressure over to my left side, which is something that I think we, we get to eventually. But so the, the, the key thing you want to take home here is for right now, 230% vertical force he can produce in a counter movement jump, which is where you start standing up, uh, you bend down, and then you jump up in the air. And, and then what you want to notice is the shape of that curve. Sure. Yeah. So looking at the rate, how quickly it's going up towards the peak and the shape of it is, is all something you want to um, look at. And also what I like to do is I like to take this initial jump and get into his kind of bottom position here. So for the next one, you want to kind of have him reproduce this position in terms of his hip, knee and ankle angles. So he's kind of basically so you're comparing apples to apples to apples and you have and you, the, and you can draw those angles in if you want and then have the person get in to do their next test and actually match it exactly. Right, perfect. So then the next test is, we got, I think JD's back there. Um, John Dunnigan's back there. We were running this test together. So we put a little uh, club under his butt here so that he can't go down any further. And then you'll see when he gets into his position here, actually looking at this now, I don't know how good of a job we did at reproducing the position. It looks like he was a little bit lower in the first one, but. Um, so you get him into this squat position and he holds it for a while. Um, and what you lower should technically make him be able to get more. Right. Yeah, totally. He would actually, he would actually outperform even more the other way. Yeah. If we had him with more range of motion for sure. And so you could see with the club under his butt, he can't go down any further. And the way you can tell if he's cheating is this little negative piece of, of, uh, vertical here. So he cheated a little bit. He did a little tiny, um, counter movement here and that's how you can tell if they do this perfectly correctly that counter movement will be zero and there won't be a negative vertical force that's where he's accelerating downwards towards the ground but anyways so in this and, and most you know exercise professionals would say you could jump way higher doing a counter movement jump than a squat jump right because you're incorporating the stretch sorting cycle and that's stuff that we've learned you know in a kinesiology class um, but not all the time and so you'll see here when he starts that squat position and hangs out for a while and we take away a lot of that stretch shortened cycle, he now produces 253% vertical. So he's getting, what is that, 20 something percent vertical more uh, in the counter movement jump or in the squat jump, sorry. All right, so most people, if you said jump up and you can't, you, normal versus you can't go down before you go up, most people would say there's no way I can create more force that way. Right. And most of the time, even when you test people doing this, if you ask them before showing them the data, which one did you do better on? Almost everyone will tell you they did better on the counter move. Right. Even when they didn't. Yeah. It just feels like they've done it better or more athletically or whatever it is. And so showing this, like, look at the rate of force development. So the, the, the slope is much steeper here and it gets to a much higher number. So clearly he's a much much better able to produce force at a higher rate and more force uh, if you have him not have to use his stretch shortened cycle quite as much. And, and there's a question, you know, if you had him 10, 15 years ago, maybe it would have been different, but this animal right now um, is producing more force at a higher rate in a, in a squat jump than in a counter movement jump, which tells us he's a releaser. All right, so just going back, I mean, so again, we're looking at the ability to use that stretching of the muscles, the neuromuscular system to fire off the body to do that stuff, right? So mm -hmm. he's not you benefiting from the stretch and shorten, just no. like an X factor stretch is a stretch shorten. He is not neurologically bending. I mean, obviously jumping is not the golf swing, mm -hmm. but your nervous system doesn't really care whether you're swinging golf or jumping up and down or do doing whatever. It has no, it doesn't care. Your nervous system is your nervous system. Right. So um, we can use a test like this and still identify that issue either way. Right. And so once we saw this, I said, well, you're a releaser. And he said, what does that mean? I'm like, well, you kind of got to get released more. You want to move your pelvis, you kind of move everything, kind of get a longer swing. I talked about, you know, maybe releasing the left knee towards the right. I can't remember the exact um, term we gave him or the exact cue we gave him. But I, I remember him saying, well, I've been trying to restrict the motion of my pelvis in the backswing, like keep my pelvis still and turn against it. That's, that's the way he had always played. Right. That's the way I've always played. That's what my teacher told me to do when I was young. And I said, well, let's try a different way. Let's try to really kind of release that pelvis and turn everything behind the ball. And so this was his first swing after he released. And you can see that speed's gone up. What was it originally? 83 point something? Yeah, 83.6 or something. 83.6 and it's gone to 92.9. So with just one little different thought in his golf swing, 
he's produced a lot more speed. 10 um, miles an hour. 10 miles an hour, which is a With significant change. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for somebody who told you he wants more speed. Um, and so John Dunnigan is kind of in the way here, but we'll give him a free pass on that one. Um, so you can see there are kinematic differences in terms of just looking at the swing. Um, and definitely there are force differences. Um, there's more vertical force happening here. A lot of these other forces have, have gone up too. Um, the face to path relationship has got less as well. So less left curve on that ball. So um, everything I would say is good about what's happened so far. Um, and then then the next, if you just want to talk about the next set of tests that you would do after that. Yeah, so once I determine, are you a resistor or a releaser? So in this example, do you, are you better off with the counter movement jump versus the regular squat jump? Then we want to start looking at leg dominance and how you use your legs properly. So, you know, obviously pivot and all that stuff plays a role in how this works because how you're going to load your system. But I do think that we haven't looked enough at leg dominance in golf and how you use your legs properly uh, in what you're doing. So I basically then... Once I've decided you're in, for him specifically, he's a non-counter movement jumper, then we're going to have him do a non-counter movement jump off, off both his right and his left leg, and then determine which leg is the dominant leg that he needs to be thinking about or trying to use more efficiently in his golf swing. So we right. do the same exact testing that we did before um, and, and measure those forces to look at dominant side. So. On a single leg, yeah. So once you decide which one is his best one, we look now at his right leg jump. So he just stands on his right leg and you see that I'm hit the back there holding the club. So this is a non-counter movement jump. And you'll see that he tries to do a non-counter movement jump, but he does get a little counter movement there. But that's something that, you know, it's, it's not too bad. Just want him to do the best he can. And he gets 194% vertical force off his right leg. Um, and then if we get him on his left leg, he gets um, 100 and or 206 percent. So he's getting again about what's that? What's that? About 10, 15 percent, 20 percent ish more force off his left leg than off his right leg, which we would say he's he's more of a left leg uh, dominant person. Uh, his left leg is stronger, can produce more force. You can see the rate of force development there is a lot greater off his left leg as well. Um, and this is something that we'll be discussing a lot more of this dominant leg or posting style testing um, that we'll be doing next week uh, in this uh, webinar with Mike Adams. Um, but in that particular case, what we did is, it, um, and when we talk with Mike next week, we're going to talk about a more left leg dominant person who's going to need more of the vertical force in their swing. Uh, they're going to have to produce more vertical force and kind of keep, keep uh, stacked up a little bit more on that lead side to create that vertical force. And so I think that's the cue we gave him was just to create more left leg vertical force in his swing. And you can see this was the final swing he took before he left us. Um, his vertical force now looks a lot more efficient. He's got from basically nothing to 140%. Um, other forces looking a lot better too. The torque's up to the tour average there. Um, face to path relationship got a lot tighter. So a lot less left curvature. And he's at up again now another two miles an hour or so from before. So and then um, a summary slide of all the statistics there. Right. So that was an example of the whole process you would go through. Um, and this was just an acute example, right? This was a guy that came by for like 10 minutes and we did a little testing and, and got some positive results. Um, but when you use this, this is this is what you tend to find if people are using the ground inefficiently or or using a swing that's inefficient for their body, which we discovered with him. Um, and so let me go back to your slides here. Um, Okay, so we've gone through all these. These are all the videos that we just showed you. Um, and there we go. All right, so um, if anyone could give a golf lesson and, and end up from the original swing looking like that one to the final swing looking like that, um, that's probably going to be a pretty effective golf lesson. With about with three swings. With three. <laughs> exactly. And, and again, I mean, this is where I've been talking to a lot of, um, you know, my motor learning expert buddies um, and, and saying this is he, he hasn't really learned anything here. Right. It, we've found something that I think is a good ingredient in his golf swing. But will that still be there, you know, tomorrow uh, on the first tee or, or wherever? So I think when we go through some of the Debbie stuff, which is really interesting, some of the drills she does with her better players and how do you get changes like this to stick is, is a really interesting question or problem. But but I think to me, this is a really effective tool at finding the ingredients that are good for people um, in their swings. And you'll, you'll find results like this quite a bit um, when you use this type of testing protocol.
I think awesome. anytime, anytime you're fighting physiology, you're making your job as a teacher much harder. Anytime you're using physiology to your advantage, you're making your life easier. I think right. I don't think that's even for debate, right? I mean, the motor learning thing is a part of it, but I think even to have to learn any skill, um, if you're doing it against your physiology, it's going to be harder to learn. And if you're doing it with your physiology, it's going to be easier to learn. Good. Okay. So um, I think we talked about this before. I knew this question would come up. Uh, so could instructors without a swing catalyst use an app that measures vertical jump height to draw conclusions about resistors or releasers and right and left leg? Yes, you can. So I think I I think it's just let me look on my phone here. I'm on my, uh, my jump Two is a great app on the iPhone um, that you can use. They have squat jumps and counter movement jumps and all that stuff built right into your phone. You put it in, you put it, you know, secure your phone, you do your jumping, it's measuring, you know, it's using hang time as basically a way of calculating these things. But you know, I think Scott would agree that those are pretty, pretty good numbers as a simple way to do it. Yeah, and you can get you know very good accurate number. Just try to make sure they're not like tucking their knees up when you go into the air and all that stuff. That their jump technique is you know pretty honest and similar going on both tech sides. Okay, and one more here before we let you or before we move on. Um, how much more does the counter movement jump have to be? How much more force, I guess, has do they have to produce compared to the squat jump to make a determination one way or the other? Yeah. So for me, if I'm going to try to change, if I'm going to change someone. You know, again, depends on how bad they need the yardage, I guess, number one. But right. <laughs> number two is I think I got to see at least uh, 10 to 15 percent improvement from the one to the other for me to say I'm going to change you. Right. Because if you're changing, you're changing. Right. So, again, then you have the learning skill and all the other stuff that comes in. But if I'm at 10 to 15 percent better, I think the average person, let's say if they drive it, you know, 230 yards and you can give them 10 percent on that or whatever. Most people will take that real fast. Mm -hmm. And as we know, driving distance obviously is, you know, from a scoring perspective, the most important statistic there is. So perfect. Um, the questions are coming in hot and heavy now. Um, <laughs> um, I, I think I'll answer this one. So, with leg dominance testing, do you typically do only one cycle of the test? Um, could familiarity with one side affect the performance of the data? And, and I would agree with that completely. It just depends how much time you have. I know, well, like when I do leg like, dom. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. I like to do three jumps of all yeah. the all the tests. I like to do three three of all of them. Right. Yeah. So you would, and, and whenever I do like dominance type testing, it's better to do multiple tests and calculate an average of each condition uh, and the standard deviation across that condition. So how consistent they are in each condition is is definitely better. Um, but obviously that takes more time. So yeah, the example we just gave you it was a quick little thing we did at the PGA show where the guy came by the booth for five minutes and probably didn't want to stick around to do um, ten different versions of each test um but yeah definitely you definitely do want and I, I i like that method of doing a little mini scientific study with each golfer um to get an idea of you know the, how how consistent they are and how much force they produce or how much club head speed they produce in all these different conditions because that makes it obviously a lot more um scientifically valid so that's a really good question all right do you want to discuss anything on this slide ben or the the training type stuff or uh, you want to get into what Kev and Deb do first, and then we can... Okay, yeah, let's do that. Good call. Perfect. All right. So there's Ben's information if you need to get in touch uh, with Ben. Um, and we will move on. What happens yeah, now? There we go. Perfect. Instagram, whatever. All that, nonsense. <laughs> all that nonsense. Perfect. All right. And so now let me stop sharing my screen and give you back to Kevin. So Kevin has a good example of a, of a pretty good player that he's worked with. Um, are you now sharing your screen, Kev? I am about to. Okay. Got somebody on the phone. Somebody's on the phone. Yeah. I don't know how, <laughs> how they got into the article. <laughs> how do they do that? I was like, what's going on here? They're right, sneaky. Can everyone see? Yeah, I think screen? we got you. Yeah, Perfect. So, um, this player, I started working with him last December. His, uh, his name is Ami. Uh, he's in pretty good shape. He, he played high school and college golf. Uh, not a real great college player, but but was good enough to play in college. Uh, went to medical school, so he stopped playing golf for a number of years and uh, wanted to want to get back into competitive golf. He's got some time to work on his game, so I'll play the swing here at regular speed first, so everyone kind of see it and you can see the graphs. You know, and he's got a pretty looking swing. Hits this was a this was a seven iron that 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 he was swinging. You can see his club speed there was eighty one and a half miles an hour. 
his directional control is pretty good, but you know, for, for a good player, I felt like he kind of hit it nowhere. Um, and, and he kind of agreed that with the players that you know, with who he was playing with, he was, he was being out driven consistently and, and hitting, you know, players were hitting two clubs longer than he was. And, and again, if you look at it, it's not, not too bad of a swing. Um, so just like I do with all of my players, I, I put them through an assessment. You know, I do the, you know, the Mike Adams stuff with them. And then I did the, the, um, the resistor releaser. Now this is only part of the test. And because I didn't save the other one, because this is the one that I wanted to focus on. And he was definitely pretty good at doing this. You know, his, the magnitude of everything and how he jumped was much better. So we deemed him as a resistor. Um, generated, you know, 296, you know, pounds of uh, uh, newtons of force here vertically. I think with the other test, it was it was actually significantly less. So so we worked on stuff that helped him resist. And, and one of the things that really caught my eye, if I go back to this first swing, if you look at his tempo, you know, his rhythm was 6.7 to one which was just off the chart slow. Um, you know, I don't think you have to be three to one, but I think you need to be near three to one, but 6.7 to one, well, you can see his backswing, his backswing time was two, you know, over 2000 milliseconds. So it just took a long time to really develop it, his swing. And then, and then he kind of tried to hit it hard from there. But, and I think being a, a resistor, that, that slowness really hurt him. So from there, we went into some exercises and let me jump over to here. So this was one of the first ones. We did determine that he was a left leg dominant. Uh, so I had him hit some balls like this and you can immediately see how his vertical jumped way up just by going left leg only. Uh, and his club speed went from 81 to 86. I really like this drill too, because for somebody like him who's left leg dominant, having some horizontal force is probably not ideal for them. And you've put him in a position here where his setup gives him incentive to not produce horizontal force, because you see you're right at the edge of your little platform. So if yeah, he does right produce, edge, like, yeah. Right. So if he does produce horizontal force, he's going to fall over. And and to me, that's a really good way to create a drill is to give them incentive to do it. Um, and, and this would be, I always said, you know, if you want people to do this drill properly, take them to top golf and put them on the third level right, right at the very edge <laughs> and, yeah. and they'll do it. <laughs> yeah. and, and he mentioned he was a little worried about falling over. <laughs> and this is one of the swings. I actually do think I, I, I didn't, I didn't restave it, but I actually do think he fell over the first few times until he learned how to stabilize. Right. Uh, so, and, and he is a, he's a center post golfer. So when you talk about Mike Adams stuff next week, they'll understand that, but he, he's a center to a, almost a left poster, definitely left side dominant. And, and he actually went out, we actually went outside, hit some balls and he, and he was really, really pretty good with, with everything. Um, then we, then we continued on. So we did that drill. Then we went to another drill on another day. So here you can see, I've got an elastic band around his hip. So I'm trying to pull him towards the target. So he's got to learn how to stabilize, uh, himself here. I'll play this here so you can see it. And he, you know, this was early on and he's, you can see he almost loses it a little bit. So this is something we talked about in the first uh, webinar, which is using reactive neuromuscular training. So if you pull them in the direction where their kind of mistake is happening and they have to figure out how to stop it, um, that's what you're doing here. And um, yeah, you, you can really see how his, how his lateral force has changed quite a bit. On, from the right side and his breaking on the left side greatly increased. Um, so, so, so we did that. We had him hit some balls doing that. I obviously got out of the way when we hit some balls, but <laughs> we had some balls doing this and, and, you know, continue to see it, uh, an improvement. And I think one of the questions on Facebook was how to make a change stick. And I think just challenging the player in different ways, focusing on the same issue you know, was one of the ways to help make things stick with this player. So then we continued on. So this was after, so I removed the band. Let me see if I got the right video here. And you got your orange peel out. Yeah. So, so then I went to just another exercise here with them. So I put them on a, 
on an upslope with the orange peel swing and just kind of, you know, just, just a little different challenge. So he's really got to learn how to brace against that left leg. He did that a few times. Just um, here, make sure he doesn't hit the plate because that yeah, could be dangerous. I, 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 haven't <laughs> that. I definitely made sure that he didn't. That was a, a little scary moment there. And then and we went to the other side of the, uh, I don't have the video. We went to the other side, but then this was towards the end of the, you know, towards the end of it. So this was, uh, I forget how many weeks later, you can see now his, his swing speed went up. You know, he's cruising at 87 miles an hour now. His horizontal forces came down. His vertical forces went up. Uh, he went from playing a draw to an overdraw uh, to, a, to a straight to a slight fade, which gave him more control, which he really enjoyed. And then his tempo, if you remember his tempo when we started, it was 6.7 to 1. And now his tempo is down to 3.8 to 1, which was, to him, felt really, really fast. Uh, but when he when he saw the swing live and he sees it on here, he you know and he sees the how the the ball reacts. Uh, it was a you know much better ball flight, and he was able to able to sustain this swing. And you know to him it it felt this feels like a three quarter swing at really quick tempo. Uh, and he, you know, but he was really happy with the results. That's awesome. So uh, that's a cool feature, again, of the SwingCat software you're showing there is the, the tempo and rhythm. So once you set um, the little tabs to say when the start of the backswing is, when the top um, of the backswing and or where transition is and where impact is, it gives you an idea of tempo. And um, is that something you see often? Obviously, it makes a lot of sense that a resistor would have a much uh, lower ratio of backswing to downswing time. Does that make sense, Ben? Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can be ballistic slow. Right. Right. I mean, right. So, I, again, not that you necessarily have to be excessively fast, but I think, you know, Kev did a great job here. I mean, obviously, that kid was slow. Like, he was. Yeah, he's he having was, a coffee in his backswing there before no, he, he was, hit it. He was, yeah, it was. <laughs> and, and he didn't really, you know, he knew he was slow in his backswing, but when you show him a number, when, when I pulled up, when I pulled up your swing, when I pulled up the swing here, and, and, and I saw it. I mean, obviously, it's very apparent when you watch him. You know, and I saw his swing, and, you know, it's, you know this is normal speed, and then have him come down. And I asked him if he was trying to do that. And he goes, well, I'm trying to be, you know, I'm trying to have some control in his backswing because he was working on some things that, that I didn't really like in his swing. And I'm like, well, let's, let's be a little bit of an athlete that you can do. And, and so that, you know, and then I showed him his tempo and it, it really affected his mindset. It's like, wow, that, you know, because he knows he's, he's, he's got a pretty good golf IQ and he knows the three to one ratios and that stuff. And he's like, wow, I didn't realize I was that slow. Um, you know, and then he was a, uh, like I said, he's a kind of a center to a front post golfer. So he gets into his right side there and then he's got to have a lot of lateral. And, and this is where I felt like he was struggling with, with his face control and his swing, and, you know, timing it up. So he had to get slower and kind of control the face where he felt like if he went faster, missed a lot of shots to the left. And I actually tested him and he did, he missed everything started kind of being a pull hook. So, um, it was, uh, you know, it, it wasn't too hard to, to, to change him and get him to buy into to what we were going to, to end up to go from this swing here at six, 81 miles an hour and 6.7 uh, tempo to, to this swing here where he's swinging 80, you know, 87, 88 miles an hour and, and hitting a shot that he knows he can play under pressure. That's awesome. Really good. And I, I like that looking at the tempo because that, yeah, like you say, it's really tough to be ballistic slow. So if they test out to be a resistor, which is the opposite of what the last guy tested out to be, taking a little time away from them and shortening things up, I think is is really good. And and like you say, working on that vertical force was good to get him to put the brakes on. And that's what I see there, that horizontal braking force, which you kind of see like right in here. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, probably not. Um, but the, if you just put your cursor over that horizontal braking force there, Kev, yeah, right there. So slamming on the brakes and posting up through that lead side is something that's happening a lot more efficiently there in that second swing, which is awesome. And I think that really helped putting him on the edge of that platform and, and giving him yeah, and, an and incentive. And, and I think that's important because, you know, that braking system is, is equally important as, as the accelerating part to the pushing off. Uh, somebody wanted the pressure, the trace here was pressure. Okay, um, yeah, go so, for it. You know, you know, I think being able to brace 
to swing is equally important because you can you can generate all this power coming down, but if you can't stop yourself early, you know, you, you know you're gonna bad things are gonna happen. One, you can get hurt, you fall out of control. You know, players who tend to fall on their toes quite a bit aren't using their bodies very well. Uh, you know, and that's the braking system part. So I think who asked about? I think Alan asked to see the the uh, right. trace. So this is the trace of the good swing. And then let me pull up the trace of his original swing here for you. So you can definitely see a much more linear, right? You know, trace. Yeah. Which you know, Ben, you know, you can elaborate more on this, but I typically find traces that are typically more linear are players tend to swing a little slower, tend to be maybe a little bit straighter, but don't hit it as far. Would you agree with that, Ben? Yeah, I think that's a fair way of thinking about it because they're not getting as a, they're not going to get as much of the, some of the other forces because they're moving so much this way. Uh, obviously, the verticals and the torque can be a little lower, and I don't think they get as much of a good load into the big muscles of their hip musculature on that trail leg uh, because they don't get it deep into that right heel. Yeah. yeah. And then yeah. he doesn't get as much, it looks like, into he, it goes down to his heel at the left side really quickly, so uh, it's tough to create vertical forces from your heel. So. The other one you can see he really loads the ball of his foot a lot better to create those breaking and, and vertical forces on well, the lots of great players have done this too so i mean you, you can be a really good player doing that sure okay. yeah 100 percent. yeah so there, there's it's different animal but we're, we're finding that for him this wasn't a match and so creating those changes that you can see where that one gets way, way more into the ball of his foot um yeah. seems to and be a much better one match. of the other things you know i narrowed his stance you know you can see his stance is two inches narrower from the centers of pressure on his feet which was which made it pure for him to, to stay a little more centered and and be able to rotate and break against his left side right that's good and a little less horizontal force there too good awesome yeah. thanks so much kevin that was a great example um and so we will move on in the interest of time here we're we're, we're going long today but it's okay because i think this is great stuff uh we'll move over to debbie so let me uh share my screen scotty all right, and let me move over to Debbie's presentation here. So we're going to talk about one of Debbie's players who is a Division I golfer. Is it Florida State? She is. Okay, and so I'll play this swing. This was her initial swing, so just tell us a little bit about her. So she, I've been teaching her since, I don't know, she's 13, 14, really good athlete, number one in, you know, our area in New York, obviously, um, recruited and just in terms of her personality she's very organized uh, she does like block practice um, she is very sensitive oh and simple um, so you have to keep all that in mind when we did what we did and when Ben and I specifically work together which I said I like uh, specifically you know with players who are really good that I don't want to injure them. I want them to get better. I want to make sure we're on the right page. I want to have the stored and you have to go back to it. And for sure that the people that I incorporate with these kinds of players, you know, I implicitly trust. And um, one thing that McLean always said to us is good teachers teach a lot. And that's all we do. That's all Kevin and I do is teach. You know, Ben does what he's been doing for the last 25, 30 years. You've been doing what you've been doing for many, many years. So I, shape or form, um, want to do 3D in any kind of uh, explicit way because I don't do it every day for 30 years. So I farm that out. And she is has been on 3D. We have it. And then obviously I took her to see Ben. So keeping all that in mind, you know, she doesn't know what Ben and I saw and what Ben and I talked about. And so we're very careful what we relayed to her. Oh, we got somebody on the phone you gotta, here. You got to mute that person. Okay. I wonder if that's, is that Mike? I don't know. I asked Mike to join us, but. Oh, maybe that's Mike. Oh, yeah. It's oh, that is Mike. It's a 561 number. Okay. Yeah. We'll get Mike in a sec. He's on the phone there. So hopefully he can hear us. Um, I don't hey, know Mike. how you sign in on your phone. What's up, man? Good. All right. We're just finishing up here with Debbie, and we'll, we'll get to you in a sec. No, I heard all of Kevin's, too. Awesome. Perfect. Sounds good, man. We'll be right with you. Hi, Mike. Hey, Deb. All right. So let's go I to... I was calling you the other day, Mike. 
<laughs> it's a mic love fest. Right. Okay. So this is just another down the line initial swing. So talk about, I mean, I really like what you said there. Um, I mean, that's something that I think golf instructors don't think enough about is, is who is that human being in front of you. So talking about the fact that she is so sensitive and, and that kind of stuff is super important to understand what type of information you give them. Yes, so around. these are obviously two different swings. Uh, she probably took them at school. I don't really remember, but it is clear if if uh, you see what she's doing now, especially for the teachers watching, you know, you'll see an inherent difference at the very end of this presentation. And uh, since Mike's on the phone, she is a centered golf. Uh, ben and I did those tests with her. And... Um, you know, very skilled and very talented. So we have to keep that in mind too, as uh, we, we did some things. Her coach wanted her to hit it further. Right. And um, you say she hits it so super straight, but just needed some more speed. So that's why we went to Ben. She to does. She hits it very straight, about 240-ish. We needed her in the 250, 55, maybe with the driver, if possible. The irons, we did gain some distance, but she's a very good iron player. Um, so the focus was definitely speed and power. More important that I went to see Ben on this because I actually do need the technology to take the guesswork out and to make sure that, that we're going to grab those little tiny, um, you know, those little tiny nuances, like I said in the beginning, that I can't otherwise see with my eyes. Gotcha. Awesome. All right. So we um we have here pictures of her two individual leg tests and so you said originally ben she tested out to be a releaser yeah so this is a different date she had come deb had brought her to see me twice and we had originally done the testing and had her identified as a releaser so then she was in college playing trying to get a little more yardage she's like hey maybe we can we find somewhere where we can pick a little bit more speed from her so when she came back, we did some of the, we had not originally done leg dominance testing. So we did some leg dominance testing and here you go. And so this one's really interesting because you see she produces 210% uh, vertical, 200% of her body weight um, on her right leg. And then on her left leg, she produced 212. So definitely a very small difference there. I would say pretty much similar. And the shape of the curves look almost identical, right? You can see that they're, the rate of force development and the amount of force is, is pretty much similar. Um, so this kind of would help confirm that she's more of a centered golfer that really doesn't have a dominant leg or, or a super dominant leg. Um, obviously it looks like the left is a little bit more, but 2% could be within the margin of, you know, of variability on that test. So 1%. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so that's, uh, so that kind of identified, Hey, she should be kind of using both legs equally, right? She, there shouldn't be a real dominant side as, as we talked about. I mean, Kev kind of worked a lot with that last guy to get his left leg working better and getting embracing and producing vertical forces. This golfer looks like that she should be using both of her legs kind of evenly. Especially given that she's a center golfer, right. as Mike would say, you know, then definitely let's be using both, both legs. So that turned out to be a good thing. Perfect. And so then you'll see that um, this is one of her kind of pre-swings she took that you told me here, Deb. And so you can see the one thing that pointed out looking at the pressure is that she's entirely on her left side, 95% of her left side here at impact, which 95% um, on your left side makes it really tough to use your, your right leg. And also the, the pre-impact too, Ben did look at her swings um, on swing cap before this presentation and certainly at the delivery position it was just way too left and, and so ben and i went and grabbed um right foot pressure as the catalyst for what you're about to see yeah she cool. was like 93 percent on her left side at like arms parallel downswing right so that and that's i think a lot of times golf tech instructors will work on getting people left sooner um but not for everyone right so that's that's something that with or, the with, but, also with a six iron, 93% on your left side by arms parallel downswing. I mean, look, it's good to be sooner, but like there's also, you can also overcook that. You can overcook it and that's with anything, right? So you can, <laughs> you can always have too much of a good thing for sure. And I think that's, that's where, exactly, right. She's a great player. She's just doing too much of a good thing. Right. 100%. And can I interject here too? I, I know that there are some teachers um, at, at, and none of my peers, you know, but, but I do like working hand in hand, specifically with Ben at, at this juncture, and, and he was brought into the fold. But I have absolutely no problem and value the relationship and the insight from somebody like Ben and you, Scott, as well. I mean, there's no question 
that that this is a team effort here because everybody brings something to the tables and i know that there are some teachers that maybe don't do that and that is just not the way i work and um, certainly not the people that i work with perfect and i think it does take a little bit of uh i don't know what you want to call it you have to be pretty confident in yourself to to realize what you don't know and to seek out answers so um that that's really good that you're you're able to do that and that you have access to such uh smart people like Ben around to do this for you. And so here we're gonna show some drills that you guys were working on. Um, and so let me start this one. I think Ben, this is your, your kind of uh, vertical force off the right leg drill. So this is really important and I want everybody to stand here too. If you notice, so when I do this, I have to stand on a chair and you know, some, some students um, get a little bit nervous because I'm obviously short. So, but then if you notice where he's placing his elbow and he'll talk a little bit more about it but the vectors have to be right here and um, i see a lot of teachers on instagram and social media and and putting forces in places which may not be right so i think that as teachers are watching be careful of where you want the force to ride in order to make the change yeah so like in that in this example like I want her to drive off of her right leg up over her left side on a diagonal vector, right? So that's we're trying to get her to use the inside ball of her right foot to push up and over to her right side. You know, typically when I see people doing this, they're just pushing down on the person's shoulder, right? Or maybe not even that at all. But really the key is finding the position of your forearm to be on the exact vector that they're on. So they're pushing literally right through. So I would say you're pushing yourself up right through my forearm. And I'm trying to create a very specific force vector for that person to feel against. Because if I have my force on that vector, that's what's being pushed back through her body. So she can then react to that. If I have my hand like this and say push like this, I don't know where my force is going. My force might be too down here. It might be too across here. What her brain is sensing is not what I needed to respond to. I need the line of her force to match the direction of my force perfectly. So my forearm is on this angle, so she can push on that. And I think it's an important idea anytime you're using r &T or any of these types of methods where you're putting load and forces into people's body, that vector specificity is really, really important. Yeah, that's good. That's and this why, this is specifically why when you're dealing with good players, I mean, you can screw up a good player really quick. And, and I just don't have the wherewithal and the time to even remotely have that happen. So you can see how important this, this feel is. Because if I did this and I wasn't, you know, really thoroughly thinking about it and screw this would, first of all, this, this would be worthless. And second of all, it might screw her up. Sure, and I think if he's pushing straight down on her shoulder, that would get her to push more off her left, and that's what you're trying to get her away from. Um, and so if his forearm is vertical straight down, then you might make the problem worse, right? But having that angle to his forearm really forces her to push off her right leg, which is accomplishing the goal that you wanted it to. Yeah. Cool, awesome. That's a really cool drill using RNT there to create vertical force off the right. And then this was hit the impulsive drill here that you got her doing to create some more push off that right side. Ben, if you wanna talk about this one. You can show it first, but yeah. Oh, sorry, is it not showing on your side? I'm just standing. Yeah. She's going to do it now. This was very hard for her to do in the beginning. I obviously uh, clipped it at the end so she looks a little more coordinated. <laughs> but she watches this. But um, also, you know, this is a little bit of the secret sauce here. But ben was yeah, so, willing to share it. So here you go. Yeah, so I think that a lot of times people are using like big jumps as a way to teach golf or create ground forces and jumps. But we have to understand the timing of jumping, right? Like, and the timing of the forces of the downswing, right? So you only have, call it 0.3-ish seconds on the downswing and it's not all being done with vertical force. Part of that time is initially you gotta have your bump and your turn and your, all this stuff happening, right? So what people need to understand is the, the vertical happens like this if it's done right there's this quick kind of impulse type jumping where stiffness is created by the person. So you can see here, when her foot hits that box, she needs to create stiffness immediately. There should be no more continued bending of her knee when the foot hits the box and immediately the force goes the other way. And that ability to create that stabilization or stiffness we call it, and then create that vertical force is really the key to making this happen. It's almost like she's hitting the, she's hitting the ground 
and then go against it. But when you hit it, you can either collapse or that force can be sent in equal and opposite <laughs> direction, right? So we're trying to teach her to understand how to create stiffness so that when she hits the ground, she's getting it back versus not getting it back. I and like it. Okay. Debbie, did she ever have By any way, pain? No, she, she doesn't have any pain. Uh, the workouts that she does at school, um, I would say are okay. Um, and these are things, she's a very uh, conscientious student. So these are things she took right home to school. Every time she would come home, I mean, it was sometimes right in the middle of a weekend. She was like, I just need to come home. I need to see my team. I need to get better. I need to have stuff to work on. Right. And these are things she was able to do in her apartment. Cool. All right. And one more here. This is the uh, push off the trail leg. And I like that one, the lifting of the front leg to create that. And you got a little RNT here with the band pulling her backwards. Yeah, again, this was very difficult for her to do in the beginning. I'm showing a, a good, and she has to do both sides, but I'll let Ben explain exactly what she's doing in these. I'm trying to, again, we're trying to get her to feel that right foot pushing her up and across. We want to create some vertical. And again, the band is trying to pull her back. So again, if we think about that diagonal vector here, she's got to use the, it's pulling her, off of her right leg so she's got to load into that right side and then push up and across i mean this could even be a little bit better i guess we took that band and put it low attached right the attachment point down low um i don't remember what point of this we were, were at it so again i think this is out of order actually <laughs> how we did it but it does it doesn't really matter but the idea is that she's trying to push herself up and to the left with her right leg right so while this thing's pulling she's got no she's got a released hip turn as you see there yeah, right? she actually literally is picking her left foot up off the ground. So it's totally loading her right leg. And then she's using her right leg only to push up and to the left. That's good. On that diagonal. By the way, and she's a releaser. If right. I, she's she releasing tested out to be a releaser. Foot. She's going into the right side, that left. But then what else is she doing is then she's doing that impulse punch with the left foot as it comes down, right? So you really see the good. right pushes her over and across, and then she hits with that left impulse on the left side. Cool. Right? We've connected those two kind of feelings for her, that up and to the right, and the impulse on the left into one movement. I like it, that's really good. And so then we went to this uh, post swing, it looks like after doing a lot of this stuff, and you can see now she's only 82% into her lead side. So obviously this is giving her a lot of better chance, all this stuff you've worked on to push better off her, her right side. And so, um, using the pressure to understand that um, to make this change, I think, was, was pretty important. And, and clearly, this resulted in better uh, impact conditions as well. Right, Debbie? Yeah. So um, the next stuff that you're going to see, uh, there were some swings that are at work, which I wasn't able to get because I can't go to work. But <laughs> I'm going to show you some drills that we did on the range. Sure. And I'll, I'll give you the last swing thought that we had before she went back. So I've definitely been trained of the building block approach and she does really well with half swings. Again, I told you she loves drills. She loves to be organized um, and they're very specific to her. There's a specific timeline, how many she should be doing. Um, you can obviously see, I mean, somebody who's been teaching a long time can see if you remember her swings from the beginning, there's definitely uh, a, in the way her body moves in these half swings. We'll see it from the target line as well. I'll see the target line now. Yeah, sure. Um, and I really like using external cues like this. So the goal is don't touch the pole with your knee, basically. And so, or don't touch the pole, I guess you could say, would be a really good motor learning cue for this particular drill. Yep, she's in a pre-impact position, which she likes. She likes this drill. We've done it before. Um, her path, her old swing, was very much inside out. Um, so that's why I also have an alignment rod in there on the forward side and, and she knows. So what, after this, uh, do we have a lot of teachers watching Scott? I think so. I think it's mostly teachers. Yeah. Okay. So my next drill, if you can see all the trees on the left, yep. I have her face the trees and we hit deliberate fades. When you face the trees on the left as a good player, you're probably not going to hook it into this. So we do hit some fades after that, which is part of her protocol and her, um, what she does at school. 
And That's then awesome. you'll see another drill that I added in after this that she loved, but I'm gonna, for all the teachers out there, I'm gonna, there's a caveat to this drill. Oh, here we go, there you go. So, um, the bucket is obviously in her right foot. We're stabilizing the right foot. She does do a pump drill feel. I wish it would play in real, like fast. Is it not? It's playing on my screen fast. I just, I don't think they're seeing it. Or maybe you're not seeing it or whatever. But everyone, I think, I believe on my screen oh, is good, playing. Oh, good, because it's so much speed. better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It must be just your streaming that it's not. I think when Kev was playing, it was doing the same thing on my end. But hopefully not. Okay, it's so much end. better. So yeah. this, this really is good. It's effective. We only do it for about 10 minutes. Um, she adds that little pump in there. But what's interesting is I have a um, the Sam. And when I retested her with her right foot, as good as this looks aesthetically, it, she still needed to work on pressure down in that right foot. And sure. that's, again, where you need technology to really see if it's working. And so the last swing feel that we worked on was a little bit of a, a squat move, but more into that right side, more of what you might see um, that we did in Ben's gym. Cool. And those things really helped her. And then you're about to see the last um, yeah. swing catalyst graph. And the so before there you is on the right, unfortunately. Um, Scott, you can talk about the double thing that you see on the vertical <laughs> side. I know what that language is in teacher terms, and right. I know we don't like it, right. um, but how it went away on the left. Right, so you can see here, there's a single peak in the vertical and her verticals are a lot higher. Uh, here on the left, which is the post swing, the pre swing, she has a double peak vertical. And this is one I think that can be kind of dangerous because um, you're in that deceleration eccentric contraction mode when the ball has already been hit and you're putting a lot of force through your body here. So you can see she's putting 100 and whatever that is, looks like almost 140, 50% of her body weight through after the ball's gone. So the work is done and it should be a relaxation time. And um, when you're doing all that e eccentric contractions, um, that might not be the best. And so um, that is, you, you've made a lot of really cool changes here. We can maybe talk about the double peak vertical next week with Mike, um, but clearly a lot of good things happening there and, and a lot of it, all of it, obviously based on the testing you did with Ben to, to develop, um, to get the best strategy possible. Um, so I think that, that's really great. And it's all, you know, based on, um, data to, to make sure that you're making changes and, and looking how those changes are affecting things. And like you said, the, the bucket drill looked really good to start with uh, aesthetically, but then you got her on the plate and, and realized that, hey, we still needed some more, um, some more work on that, on the pressures to, to allow her to use her right leg a lot better. So yeah. that's a really good example, Debbie. And I, and I really like how you um, talked about, you know, the human being that you were dealing with and, and her personality and all those types of things. I think that's really important. Um, to know and I'm sure you weren't showing her all these graphs and things because she probably that would be too much information for probably somebody like this um, mm -hmm. That was information that was going in your head and you're making decisions and then you, you relay that to your player appropriately So that was a really good point that you made there and something that we all really should be thinking about when we're working with our players Thank you so much. Let me stop the share here and um, Mike are you still there? Yes, I am Awesome. We need to figure out for next week how to get you on uh, on a computer so that you can see everything <laughs> we're doing. <laughs> but for now, um, so next week we're going to be talking about, we, we introduced the concept of dominant leg testing or posting, which uh, I think everybody that's on this call kind of learned from you originally. Can you talk a little bit about how how that was developed? We'll talk about that next week. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> we will do that next week. Mike is the best, man. I like it. Hey, awesome. Kev, I had a question. Sure. Kev. Are you there, Kevin? Yeah, yeah he's there. Ahead. I'm here. When you tested the person, you found them to be down at left leg. What made you decide that they were front center post? When I well, I do the I do a couple of different tests. I do your test, uh, and then I put them on the swing cat, and I put them on the different sides of the plate to see where they generate the most vertical. Right. And yeah, so you know, he generated way more force when, you know, on his left side than, it, than, than on his right side. You know, but, but I do, I, I do a couple different, you know, like a single leg test and then I have them test on different sides of the plate. 
and then uh, you know, it's, you know, I do a couple of different tests like that to find out where where they can generate the most power from. Yeah, and there, there's lots of different tests available to you, and, and Mike will talk about his testing um, and some of the tests that I do. So we're going to talk about a whole bunch of different ways to help define uh, what somebody's dominant leg is next week when when we have Mike on here for the full time, so we can really get into that. So. Uh, we're at an hour and a half here. Let me look at some of these questions here to uh, to make sure that we answer some of the people that are on here. Um, so Tim asked, he has the balance plate, uh, Swinkow's balance plate, can he do this testing as well? And the answer is yes, so the balance plate currently has an algorithm to calculate vertical forces. Um, the forces may not be the same magnitudes um, as the ones you would get on our 3D motion plate, but they will be relatively the same. So if you get more force in one jump than the other, the balance plate will tell you that. And it can also look at timings of vertical forces. So um, I have done this testing on the balance plate so we can do that. Um, let me try to scroll, see if there's any more of these that I can. Uh... Oh, somebody asked, do the guys with left dominant or right dominant have the same eye dominance as leg dominance? Does, do any of you guys do eye dominance testing? I do, but I've never. Yeah, but they don't. They don't. Interesting. So they're generally they opposite. No, they're all over the board. All over the board. Perfect. Great answer. So yeah, so uh, somebody with a right eye dominant does not necessarily mean they're going to be left leg dominant or right and right or it's all over the board. You can be, and that's why you do testing, right, Mike? That's why we test because everybody's messy. Right. <laughs> don't want to guess. Perfect. Um, all right. I think we're getting down here in time. We've, we've spent a lot of time. If you guys have anything you want to wrap up with, uh, Ben, do you want to start? No, look, I, I, again, I mean, just doing what I do, I think that, you know, form, form dictates function. I think that's the way the world has always worked. That's the way engineering works. That's the way everything works. And that, you know, golf at the end of the day, as a teacher, is an engineering project. You're trying to engineer a model or a system or whatever you want to call it, a way to find the best pieces for your student to be successful. And while this is certainly not, you know, the only piece, it's only a small piece of what we do. What Mike does is, and there's a lot of pieces that go into it, like Deb said, personality and mental and all of this other stuff. Um, I think the more factual information that you can have and looking at the physiology of the person, how their neuromuscular system works, how their muscular system works, all that stuff is something to not be overlooked. Uh, can give you a big bang for your result really quickly, especially from a speed perspective for a lot of people. Um, and then when you match that up on top of all the other things that you guys have been teaching, you know, you really start getting this complete picture. And one of the things I really enjoyed about today is how, you know, Kev showed how he took his testing and then used tempo to help solve the problem. And Deb, you, we used pressure to help solve the problem. And that all the different components that Swing Cat's bringing to the table you can actually like decipher, you can, you can create your bucket, resistor or releaser, but there's so many tools within the system that you can use then to help coach, train, teach, learn, identify where issues are, that really it's incredible to have that opportunity to try to help people, so. Awesome, thanks so much, Ben. Kev, you have a little uh, thing you wanna to say to wrap up? Yeah, no, I, I think I agree with Ben. I think we need to, you know, as, as a, you know, from the coaching side, it's, it's important for me to have access to as much information as possible about the player. So being able to measure what they're doing with the swing cat, uh, see what, you know, understand how the body works, you know, and, and having, having a team with, you know, you and Ben and, and Mike to be able to refer back to if there's something I don't understand or something I can't figure out is, is critical. And I think coaches out there need to, you know, have a team like that. I mean, I'm fortunate to, to know everybody, you know, so I have that, but I think it's, you know, if someone out there can develop a team of people to kind of share information and, and be able to, you know, help, help the player out, you know, it, it not, it, I think it helps the player faster is, is what everyone asks me, what's technology do for you? And it's, it's, doesn't do it as much for me as it does for the player, because there are things that I can do now in, in an hour that it needed, you know, weeks to do before. So, so don't, don't be afraid to use technology, but, but make sure you're using it as a data gathering device instead of an actual teaching device. Don't let it teach for you. Right, perfect. And Debbie? I would say, I reiterate that. I mean, I'm so fortunate and lucky to have certain people in my corner and, and that I pull on all the time. As you could just see with, with Caroline, I went right to Ben and 
uh, mic on the phone is just a huge component of my my life, actually. But um, inherently, I would say there's so much erroneous information out there and a lot of tips out there that might work and they might not. But if some, if you can get value out of this to know that this exists, you can have a swing that you own that matches you versus um, just, you know, like I said, a, a tip that makes no sense. It doesn't, everybody's got their own grip, their own physiology, as Ben would say. And, and the more you can hone in on that and the more that you have a teacher that believes in that and can guide you through that, you will own your swing and you will play injury free and you will 100% play better. Awesome. Is Sadie there to say hi? She's sleeping on Millie. Oh, that's too bad. Okay. <laughs> Next time. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. This was super fun for me. It helped uh, get our minds off what's going on in the world and talk about something yeah. that we, we uh, all clearly enjoy and are passionate about. Uh, just a reminder, next week, same time, 1230 Eastern, 930 Pacific, uh, Mike Adams and I will be on talking about post posting, dominant leg testing. Um, and so we will be super excited to talk to Mike next week about that. Thanks for joining us, Mike. Hey, one more thing, Scott. Yep. Uh, as a teacher, uh, we need to invest in ourselves. You know, uh, with TrackMan and FlightScope and stuff, great investments for ourselves. But, you know, force plates, especially the 3D force plates, best set of eyes out there, and they give us the, the kinetics that we can't see. And without them, uh, it has changed my life as a teacher, uh, being able to utilize the 3D plates. Awesome, and Sadie came to say hi. She did, nice. little girl. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, there she is. Perfect, all right. Well, everyone take care of yourselves, stay healthy, stay uh, sane, try to do the best we can at this time. Um, Swink Out has decided as well to, to run another uh, webinar on Tuesday. So uh, Tim Dejarlet, our sales manager in the U.S., and uh, Andrew Rice are going to be doing one on Tuesday. Uh, so stay t t in touch with the Swing Catalyst uh, website for that. Um, they're going to be talking about how to use our app uh, to help people remotely in a golf lesson, which is a really relevant topic for right now. Um, if you have more questions about Swing Catalyst uh, in the U.S. or in North America, you can get in touch with uh, Tim Dejarlet. His email is tim at swingcatalyst.com. If you have questions in the rest of the world, Carl will help you with that. His email is carl at swingcatalyst.com, C-A-R-L. Thank you so much, Debbie, Ben, Kevin. Thanks, this was Kathleen. awesome. This Thank was you. super fun. Everybody out there, take care of yourselves. Stay healthy. Stay sane. And we will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.